Jennifer, how, how do you choose, you know, now we have a number of different therapies approved for frontline uh, treatment in CLI. We have the BTK inhibitors, we have a BCL2 inhibitor, of course, venetoclax in combination with, with rituximab or obinutuzumab based on the CLL14 trial. Uh, and there's chemoimmunotherapy. How do you choose between these three options um, when treating patients frontline? Right, so there's still a significant effect of age and comorbidities, as well as TP53 mutation just up front. So patients with TP53 mutation, I favor a BTK inhibitor. Venetoclax obinutuzumab would also be a possibility based on the CLL14 trial. But I did notice that at the ASH update last year, there was only about a 60% three-year progression for pre-survival in the subgroup of patients with 17P deletion on CLL14, which is concerning me that perhaps they may relapse earlier when we stop the drugs. The data were very incomplete. They didn't tell us about the rates of undetectable MRD versus were those still the patients who had MRD positivity or not. But with the relatively short follow-up and incomplete data still with venetoclax obinutuzumab and 17P patients, I am going toward a BTK inhibitor or even preferentially a clinical trial of dual agents if such mm -hmm. is available. For example, BTK and BCL2. So that group kind of comes out right up front. Now patients who don't have either 17P deletion or TP53 mutation, then the IGBH mutation status comes into play significantly. So for patients who are very young and fit and have a mutated IGVH without 17P, I still consider FCR an important standard of care for them, which is based on the fact that there are three reports of long-term ongoing remissions in those patients. So about a 55% progression-free survival at 12 years in patients with mutated IGVH who were treated at the MD Anderson and similar data in the German CLL study group. Furthermore, in the ECOG 1912 study, which did not stratify the randomization by IGVH, in the mutated group, the PFS is not statistically different between IR and FCR. And then there's likely at longer times to be ongoing relapse with the abrutinib, whereas we know FCR plateaus. So I think that data is still too immature to really address this question. So it, I often will suggest that to patients. And I find patients are actually quite interested in getting a therapy that will offer them 10, 12 plus years of potential remission. The unmutated patients though, even if they're very young and fit, will have continuous relapse with FCR with a median PFS of about four to five years. And in that unmutated patients, that's where most of the benefit in the ECOG 1912 study for the abrutinib rituximab was seen. And so BTK inhibitors are a reasonable option for those patients. But venetoclax obinutuzumab is also a very reasonable option. And I do find that many younger patients in particular do like time-limited therapy. Mm -hmm. And so venetoclax obinutuzumab is a one-year time-limited regimen seems to be particularly appealing to them. And they don't necessarily mind that you have to come in for more visits in the first month or two as you get started on the venetuzumab and then also get ramped up on the venetoclax. As you get to older patients, they can't tolerate FCR. So we, the mutated patients, the chemoimmunotherapies they can tolerate have less benefit. Although in the Alliance trial, for example, there was actually not a difference in the PFS in the mutated subgroup with the two and a half to three year follow-up as reported. Now that may change with longer follow-up, but it also depends on the tolerability of abrutinib. In that study, about 7% of patients actually died of abrutinib-related toxicity in both of the abrutinib arms. And this was also seen in Illuminate, the abrutinib abrutinib arm. So that's a consideration. But the benefits of chemoimmunotherapy are much less in general in these older patients. There's not a potential plateau. So in general, we're choosing between a BTK inhibitor and the venetoclax of an